Hey there. Well, um, uh, let's see how we're doing here. I took a day off. I, I had a stomach thing, so I just kind of took it easy yesterday. Um, we are in Second Corinthians 3. Now, it has admittedly been pretty heavy. This book is heavy. Uh, and I've tried to keep it um, as focused on the intimacy and the grace and the uh, humanity of Paul and the humanity of Jesus and God's care for us. Uh, even though there's heavy topics because there's discipline going on with these, uh, with this book, um, you know, the point is, is that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And uh, to have the eternal perspective is the answer to everything. And the eternal perspective just means we look to Christ. Jesus Christ is my righteousness. Jesus Christ is my approach to the Father. Jesus Christ is my position before the Father. Jesus is, uh, is the one who did everything for me. If I get my eyes off him, I fall back into the flesh with all of its carnality. Um, and that was the problem at Corinth, is that they kept being distracted from Christ with so many different things. Um, and then they were reaping the corruption that comes from just walking in the flesh and being carnal. To be carnal means that your eyes are on yourself and what you want, what your needs and your desires, right? But to be spiritual is that your eyes are more and more focused on Christ. But the way God has to get our eyes on Christ is on the one hand through a ministry that reveals him, which is the New Testament ministry. Uh, and on the other hand, he does bring us through discipline. He allows us to go through things that discover what the flesh is, where we discover through experience what the flesh is. Until you see what the flesh is, you won't give up hope on it. And until you give up hope in your flesh, Christ will be somewhat veiled to you. He'll be, uh, well, that's nice, but what about me kind of thing? Oh, well, that, that sounds really good, but that's not very practical. Give me something to do, you know. And that is the difference between uh, someone whose heart is turned to the Lord versus someone who is still in the flesh under the uh, law. You know, the law says give, being under the law means give me something to do. I can't handle just spiritual concepts and the idea that Jesus Christ, like without apart from him, I could do nothing. No, give me something to do. And as long as you're in that mode, God will let you go through things to discover that there's nothing you can do. That's the point. Okay. But sometimes people don't react well to that message. They want to build up something in the flesh, especially of a religious identity. And we see that in, you know, 1 Corinthians with the false apostles and those who are boasting in the gifts and boasting in their flesh and saying, I'm of Paul and I'm of Cephas and I'm of Apollos. Their problem was that they wanted an identity in the flesh, and that made them susceptible to deception along the lines of another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. All the things that Paul said, you know, I'm afraid you've been taken away from the simplicity, which is in Christ. There's something so simple about saying, I can do nothing. Christ has to do everything. Every day I learn to come to him. He's my source, which Paul calls in 1 Corinthians, keeping the feast. The feast is Christ himself. He's the feast of unleavened bread. There's no mixture. It's just the fine flour of the spirit of Jesus Christ and mingled with oil. That's how that unleavened bread was. It was mingled with oil, which is the Holy Spirit. And that is Christ. Christ is our food, and he purifies us. And if we don't keep the feast, if we don't keep coming to him, if we don't see that he is the answer to everything and instead rely on our natural strength, trying to build up something for ourselves, it produces an environment where the flesh prevails. And that flesh manifests itself in all the things we saw in Corinth. Unbelief, uh, false doctrine, false spirituality, boasting in the flesh, uh, a false apostles, false teachers, a false gospel, 
and the sins of the flesh. You know, that guy with his mom, with his dad's wife and people going to the temple prostitutes and people be, being gluttonous um, at the Lord's table and not discerning the body. The whole thing was a mess. But the, the root cause for all of the mess is the same. Losing sight of Christ. Not partaking of Christ. Not seeing your need for Christ. Thinking that you can do it yourself. Not understanding that Christ is everything and that God is done with me. And not judging yourself. To judge yourself means to agree with God's assessment of the flesh. He condemned it. It's not partially good and partially bad. You know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has good and evil. But he said, if you eat of it, you'll, de you'll die. Both ends in both end in death, good and evil. And that's what the flesh is. doesn't matter if you take the so-called good flesh or the bad flesh route. Either way, the end is in death. And because of that, and because we're God's children and we've been reconciled to him, and because he's faithful and he won't let us go, he disciplines us when we're walking in the flesh. Even to the point where, like, because we're in the flesh, we are not responding well to the New Testament ministry, and we're even rejecting, rejecting it and agreeing with those who stigmatize it, which was happening with Paul. You know, the, the false apostles were slandering Paul, and the saints were tempted to believe it. Well, it's a good, that's why he had to spare them by not going to Corinth and visiting them while they were in that condition, or else he would have brought a rod, and he didn't want to have to do that. He didn't want his discipline to be so hard, you know. So, the point is that, yeah, it's really heavy stuff, but it's all in the Lord's care, and it's because he doesn't want us to walk in the flesh, he wants us to walk in the spirit, and we don't understand our need for it, because we think we're pretty good. And so the situation at Corinth, the root cause is self-confidence of the problems there, is confidence in the flesh, walking according to the flesh, which is to be carnal, and to have a life that's void of Christ, because you just don't see your need. But by the time Paul was ready to re write this letter, they were starting to see their need, because he wrote them a last letter, which was so full of rebukes and discipline that they were scared and they thought that the apostle had written them off you know maybe they were done and now he's affirming them while still it's a heavy tone you know but sometimes when god's heavy with us that doesn't mean that we are not his children disqualified not the heirs not going to rejoice in the day of jesus christ no we just go through heaviness through his discipline we see that in hebrews 12 you know no discipline while it's going on seems pleasant but afterwards it does yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness and there's no child who is not disciplined who's you know we are disciplined because we don't by nature know what the flesh is the point of discipline is to get us to partake of christ and keep the feast and enjoy him and make him our life and make him our satisfaction so that we live by him inwardly washing us and we just have a refreshed moment by moment dependency on him and as we learn to depend on him we enter a rest and we know his love more we know his peace more we know his joy more we stop kicking against the goads we stop fighting against him and we start to just su submit you know not through strength but through weakness through a proper judgment of our flesh through an acknowledgement that the flesh has nothing good in it and which which is exposed through discipline discipline is just look you go through these situations where you discover what you are god allowed you to actually do the thing that you thought a christian couldn't do and then what are you going to do are you still saved you know you used to think, no, there's no way someone like that could be saved, but now you are like that. What are you going to do? Well, the point is to teach you to come to Christ no matter what condition you're in, so that he becomes your food, he becomes your strength, he becomes your nourishment, he becomes your source and your sufficiency, so that you'll no longer trust in yourself. And Paul, an apostle who is completely in the will of God, 
is learning the same lesson and brought through the same things. He's brought through affliction so that he can be brought to the comforts. And he's becoming, as we said, a storehouse of comforts for the saints who are also undergoing the same kind of things. Now, their confidence in the flesh is causing all kinds of fleshly results, but the discipline is the same. You know, even in John 15, it says that uh, if you bear fruit, he'll prune you so that you can bear more excellent fruit, more fruit. Either way, you're going to get disciplined. Some people think that you can avoid discipline, like by being good. No, because you even your good flesh is a problem. Your strength has to be brought to zero so that Christ can tabernacle over you. And that's what 2 Corinthians is all about. It's Paul showing them himself as the pattern saying, look, you're not alone in this, even though I had to spare you by not coming to you. God has brought me through situations. I despaired even of life so that I wouldn't trust in myself, but in him who raises the dead. And I've learned to walk by trusting in Jesus Christ, which is exactly the same lesson God wants you guys to learn. You guys are walking in the flesh and in confidence in your flesh. And because of that, you've got all this carnality. But God taught me first how my flesh could, there no, in, no, in my flesh dwells no good thing. And I can't trust on my earthly wisdom and strength to get me through the environments he's bringing me through. I need resurrection. I need to be carrying about my body the dying of the Lord Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in my body. We'll see that in 2 Corinthians 4. So, He's telling them, look, the same lesson you're learning at the root is the same lesson we're learning. Even though we are not, we don't have a mess like you guys have because we've lost all confidence in the flesh. We still every day are brought into death, into weakness, so that the power of Christ can tabernacle on us. And we'll see that in 2 Corinthians 4. And that's what produces our ministry. And the same thing that produces our ministry is what's going to produce your walk of holiness. You guys are a mess. You guys are in the flesh. You guys are carnal. You got to have all kinds of situations we talked about in the last letter. But the root cause is that you're walking in the flesh. And what God wants to do is get you transferred over onto Christ for your sufficiency. And guess what? That's the same lesson we're learning. He is identifying with them. That's why he opens his heart to them and tells them, look, even though I had to write to you in such a heavy way, don't think that you're alone in these uh, lessons. We are learning to walk, not according to fleshly wisdom, earthly solutions, our strength, right? But by faith in the power of Christ to lift us up and let us walk in newness of life. That's the lesson of the Christian life. When the Lord lets you go through things, again, where you discover Wow, I am the thing that I thought that you couldn't be as a Christian. What are you going to do? Well, that's when you start to learn, really, to come to Christ and make him your righteousness. And they learn by acknowledging the gospel, your position in Christ, and learn to live as someone who works not but believes on him who justifies the ungodly and has his faith counted to him as unrighteousness or as righteousness that's not just the beginning of your christian life that's how we live the just shall live by faith we have to learn to believe that god has justified us and that that means we are qualified to come to him and we need to have our heart turned to him so that we're gazing at him and not ourselves and that's what this chapter is really about so I went to let the dog out and forgot where I was. Um, one thing I noticed, I still have a stomach thing, and I find that after I talk a bit, I'm exhausted. Um, so I probably will have to wrap this up and just call this a sidebar message. Um, the uh, oh, those dogs are going nuts today. The the uh, this is kind of like just backing up and saying, what is the context of Second Corinthians? What's going on? He's written 1 Corinthians to him in which he was so heavy-handed, and he had to be for their good, and it it really did strike a blow to their self-confidence. You can see it in the way he's responding to them as you read this letter. You can see that he's like comforting them and also saying, look, you cleared yourself. You were so zealous to 
deal with the matter with that brother and now you need to confirm your love to him and you've passed the test so to speak with that and they were humbled through that at least the church leadership and much of the leadership there's still a bunch of stuff going on but the one see when god like consider the letters to the seven churches the overcomers have an ear to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches and those are the first ones to listen and the overcomers are just the believers who really believe the gospel and are putting their trust in it at that time they're more open to the spirit obviously and uh it got through the message got through okay but he's still there's cleanup work to do and he's got to show them the root issue and what chapter three is about is the difference between the flesh and the spirit uh presented in terms of the law and the gospel the flesh likes the law because the flesh is seeking to build up its own strength and justify itself and the spirit is really the heart that's turned to the lord and see beholds him and sees his glory which the natural man can't really receive there's a veil over his heart that keeps him from seeing the glory of christ and it's the glory of christ that transforms and so second corinthians 3 is one of the most powerful chapters in the whole bible and that's why i'm gonna have to wait until i'm a little less tired to start dealing with it and then second chapter uh, chapter 4 is how god makes that turn in your heart through weakness how does he bring you to an end of your self-sufficiency so that the veil can be removed so that you're no longer approaching the bible as a list of things to do or as the letter or as law which kills but the spirit that gives life and you're beholding christ in the law i'm sorry in the word right and he's shining on you and that's transforming you um, well, that takes discipline. That takes God bringing you through various situations to bring you to weakness. Hold on. Ian, give me five minutes. Uh, various situations that bring you into weakness and bring you to an end to yourself. It takes a New Testament ministry, which unveils Christ, which we're talking about here. Um, there's a lot of things that goes into it. God has invested a lot to train his children who are saved by grace and are going to heaven anyway, how to not be miserable here on this earth. That's really the difference. The difference is, is what kind of life are you going to have? You know, um, which of course impacts what condition you're in when you see him. Like if he were to come today, would he find you rejoicing or would he find you shrinking back in shame because you think that he doesn't love you? Um, that is entirely a matter of learning to walk in the spirit and learning to behold christ and take him as your righteousness your sanctification your life and your everything which is all by faith it really just comes by beholding him but you are blinded to him while you're in your own confidence okay so paul is dealing with a whole church of self-confident people here that had confidence in their flesh and he struck a mighty blow against their flesh in the last letter and now some of them have been brought into a place of godly sorrow but now they need to see look the root of your issue was the flesh and god is done with the flesh and he's weakening the flesh he's not building it up the way you thought you thought spirituality meant to make you a mighty man of god that could do all these gifts and and be supernatural all the time but i'm going to show you another way of strength and weakness my strength is perfected in weakness and the power i i boast in weakness that the power of christ can tabernacle over me because i understand that my flesh is what keeps me from enjoying christ and this is not again affecting your salvation this is talking about growth okay you're saved and when you learn grace you know especially after being a legalist you the first thing you learn is your assurance of salvation that no matter how bad i sin i can't out sin god's grace super abundant hyper grace it is true where sin abounds grace does even more abound he's going to cause me to reign in life i'm going to stand before him like he said to the church at corinth you know you become you, the testimony of christ has been 
confirmed in you. You become, you come behind a no gift. And I'm glad to say and confident to say that you're going to be my rejoicing in the day of Christ and I'm yours. How could he say that to a church that messy? Well, because they're saved. Paul deals with brethren in the Lord, at, even in discipline, as saved people. Turn the brother over to the deliverance uh, of his flesh to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. Even that brother's saved. Now confirm your love to him. He's repented. Uh, so that's the first thing, is assurance of salvation, okay, that grace teaches you. And that kind of produces a relaxed thing for, for a little while sometimes, especially if you've been a legalist, because you can no longer, you're so exhausted, you can't do the law thing anymore. You know it's not keeping you saved. So you kind of relax. But then that gets you in the flesh, you know. And it produces a new kind of misery, which is, yes, I know I'll be in heaven, but my life is miserable. I'm just, I'm not happy here. Okay. A lot of people are longing for the rapture, not because they want to see the bridegroom, but because they live in the flesh and it's making them miserable and they don't know how to get out of it. They, they keep sowing to the flesh and reaping corruption. Their relationships are all a mess. And uh, they feel defiled all the time and condemned. And they don't know really how to deal with it. Practically, by taking Christ as life. They, that's elusive to them. Because they don't have a ministry that presents it. Instead, the ministry tells their ministry that they listen to tells them, Don't worry, we're getting out of here in five minutes. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the rapture too. But I'm excited because I know I'm going to be rejoicing when I see my bridegroom. Because I know how to abide in him today. That's a different thing. You know, I know I see so many people on these walls of the rapture channel that are absolutely miserable. And if Jesus doesn't come back, they don't know what they're going to do. They thought of suicide. They're they're miserable and they're afraid to see him. If I do commit suicide, will he, you know, I mean, it's just a mess. Um, th that is, in fact, I know someone who did commit suicide and I believe it was related to this kind of some of this kind of views. Um. I, the two Christians I've known, well, the one I knew that committed suicide many years ago did so because they were under so much condemnation in their life. We don't have to live like this, right? But but the only way to live free from condemnation is to be in the spirit. That's why it says there's no condemnation for those who are uh, in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, according to Romans 8, 1 and 2. That's really in there. And it's not talking about from God's point of view. He has not condemned us. Where he's received us and reconciled us to himself and dealt with all the problems and we have peace with God. But if we walk according to the flesh and its confidence and its strength, all we know is the letter of the law. Christ is veiled. It's like he doesn't even exist. He's just a figment of our imagination in heaven. He's not real to me today. He's not supplying me today where I feel strengthened and nourished and refreshed and thankful and have a joyful heart. No, I'm just miserable in my flesh and please somebody get me out of here. And you're even angry at God. Why did you, did you just bring me out here to die? Why does my life have to be so hard? When are you going to rescue me from this? That is the, the cry of someone who is not strengthened with might in his inner man by the spirit. That is someone who is weak and malnourished. And we can be genuinely saved Christians and weak and malnourished. So this can sound really heavy because we're talking about maturing. We're talking about the meat of the word. We're talking about walking in the spirit and learning to repudiate our, our natural strength and even judge our flesh. And so there's a heavy tone to it all, which I keep wanting to soften a little bit. But please know it's not because you're not saved. It's because you are saved and God wants to bring you into your joy. Paul had a different kind of language than 1 John. 1 John says, I write these things to you that your joy may be full. But Paul's got the same goal. His goal is to bring you into the joy of the Christian life, which is Christ himself. And he's even working on someone as bad as the church in Corinth to bring them into their joy. He didn't give up on them. And he's not going to give up on you. He knows how to teach you that Christ is everything. And that is not what the flesh doesn't like that because the flesh wants to be everything. But when you start to learn what the flesh is and you get sick and tired of it, it becomes really good news that Christ is everything. And he does become your joy.
So I'm going to have to run. Uh, I, there's just a lot of interruptions here today. And like I said, my stomach is, I'm just exhausted. So the more I talk, the more tired I am. Um, I kind of did a big recap here. I'm hope you can jump into this um, as we go. There, It seems like I've got a bunch of new subscribers for some reason. Um, the uh, Otherwise, I, I'll probably be tomorrow bef before I do another message. There's plenty of stuff in my playlist that you can check out. And um, if you're looking for something to read, uh, I have several books for free or for donation. Um, I'm going to try to mention these more often. It, uh, I put it in the link in my description. You can go and check out the books. There's uh, some good stuff in there. All right, take care.